or during the week, you may recall that we read a passage from Luke, chapter 24, where Jesus is with his disciples in person after his resurrection from the dead. Verse 45 states, Then Jesus opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. Unlike the disciples, we don't have the resurrected Jesus here with us in person today. Uh, however, what we do have is the gift of God's Holy Spirit working in our lives. So before we come to our Bible readings, which Erica and Naomi will bring us, uh, and then the sermon from Rob, I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit will open our minds now to understand what we're about to hear. Dear Lord, through your Holy Spirit, please give us faith to receive your word, understanding to know what it means, and the will to put it into practice. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thanks, Erica. Our first Bible reading this morning is from Ephesians 4. Um, you'll find it on the back of the pink handout that you were handed on the way in. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, infants tossed back and forth by the waves, and blown here and there by every wind of teaching, and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Second reading today is from 1 Corinthians 12, 1 to 11, and it's on the first, uh, on the front of the pink sheet, it's the first part there. Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is cursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone is the same God at work. Now, each one, now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to another, the interpretation of tongues. All of these are the work of the one and the same spirit, and he distributes them to each one, just as he determines.
I'm hearing a buzz. If I just turn off these speakers, will that fix it? That'll do. No. All right. Well, this year as a church, we are seeking to connect with Christ, which is about seeing new members welcomed in warmly and being a caring community. Well, for that to happen, we need to know, well, what does it mean to be a church? What is God calling us to be as a church? And so our series is about the church gathering together around Jesus. And each week we're looking at one of the five key images that God has given to us to understand what it is to be a church. And each one's really fabulous. It just gives us a deeper richer uh, understanding of the glory of church. And each one has a different emphasis. Well, today, oh, sorry, last week we looked at the Bride of Christ and that was fantastic. And if you missed it, I encourage you to get onto YouTube or the podcast and uh, have a listen. Today, we're looking at the body of Christ. And so let's pray that we would be hearing God speak to us about the church. Heavenly Father, and our great shepherd, Jesus Christ. We ask this morning that you would open the eyes of our heart, mind, and soul to see the glory of gathering together around Jesus as the church. And may the Holy Spirit unite us in Christ as his body and use each one of us to build the body of Christ. Amen. Well, I wonder what you think church is like. As you think about church, what it is, what you want it to be, is church like a cruise ship in your mind? I mean, all the passengers are, are going to the same destinations. They're doing meals together, hanging out. They've got the same purpose. It's not easy to get everybody united in the purpose. In this case, it's pleasure. Is, is church a cruise ship? Well, there's a few problems with it immediately, isn't it? It's not only passengers on the ship. There's actually just a small crew whose whole job is to serve all the passengers and make sure they have the pleasure. Um, that might be a little bit too close to reality for you, but that's not what God intends for the church, is it? Or is church like a battleship? Some really interesting ideas come with that one. A unity of purpose from the captain right through to the cook. Everyone has the same purpose, the same mission. They even wear the same uniform mostly. And, and that's because they share this identity together. And everyone serves the same mission according to their role. Everybody's got one. And all of them are needed. Every single person on the ship is essential. In fact, there are no passengers. Is that what church is like? Well, Paul, as he wants us to be thinking about church today, he's got the image of the body. And I think maybe the, the battleship is, is heading us towards thinking about the body like that. So what is Paul talking about? Well, in Romans chapter 12, verses 4 to 5, the passage will be up on the screen, but also it's on the inside of the sermon outline, a section from Romans. He just gives it to us really simply, really straightforward. Just as each one of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, it's pretty straightforward. So in Christ, we, though many, form one body. And each member belongs to all the others. That's a really great, simple summary of what it is to be the body of Christ. And that's what we're hearing about today when we think about the life of the body. And this is the key takeaway for us today. Every part is essential 
for building the body of Christ. Every part, every member is essential for building the body of Christ. The thing is, while we might be going, yeah, 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 heard that before, understand that body image, it's probably of the five, one of our more familiar ones. When we actually really stop and think about it, it's quite alien to us. It's like hearing something from an alien. When you're thinking about cruise ship, battleship, if you're honest, like me, you'll know that there was a bit of a struggle, an internal struggle of, well, I wouldn't mind the cruise ship. That'd be pretty good. See, what's going on inside of us is, wait for it, this is a big fancy title, self-expressive ind individualism. How do you define self-expressive individualism? It's others exist to fulfill me in the way that I choose. The simple version, more modern, common one is you do you. I'm, probably, you're sure, I'm sure you're full, more familiar with that one. Or as my drink bottle reminds me, be you, be true. That's self-expressive individualism. Let's just call it individualism from now on. And the thing is, we might be thinking, oh, yes, society out there, oh, they're all for that. We live in that society. We're part of that culture. Christians are not immune to individualism. We're just not. In fact, the thing we really need to recognize is it's actually our default. That's how we operate to varying extents. You know, you may not be kind of going the, on the you do you champion, but there will be still things about you that are just, hey, I want to be, it's about me. And part of the culture means that any threat to self-fulfillment is met with hostility, including the Bible's teaching on church. Even us as we sit here, we're going to be having a, a reaction against this. And it's so important that we recognize that. Because we hear about the body of Christ today, but it defaults under individualism. That's just where we place it. So we keep our individualism here if we don't recognize it. And then we just go, oh, yeah, body of Christ. Ah, oh, people caring about me. Sounds awesome. Having a place where I belong. Great. Serving others. Mm, let's just push that to the side. Or actually going out of my comfort zone. Investing time and let's just push that a bit there, but I'll keep this. If we're not aware, if we're not careful, the body just slips under our individualism thinking and default. The thing is, this kind of thinking, it's been around since the Garden of Eden, um, but actually it's intensified and been idolized since the 1960s. So I'm pretty sure that covers most people here have been alive through this time. Uh, yes, it's gained significant momentum. In the last decade, many of us are feeling like, oh, it's going nuts, but it's been around. This is why I'm confident to say it's our default. It's the air that we breathe, the way that we do life. It's why we need God today to speak to us about the life of the body of Christ. doesn't matter whether you've heard it once or a million times before. We need God to speak into this and challenge our individualism. So let's have a look at what is the body. The Apostle Paul, uh, he wrote to a church in Corinth. Uh, it's a letter called Corinthians that we had read out. Now, the, the thing about the Corinthian church is they're a messy church, right? They're all over the shop. And one of the reasons for that is they think they're super spiritual. That's why at the beginning, as we heard in our reading, Paul wants to set up, well, what actually does it mean to be spiritual or have the spirit? It's not in fancy things you do or gifts that you might display. No, it's really simple. Do you say Jesus is Lord? Well, if you do, you've got the spirit. And then when he goes on to talk about gifts, 
th these gifts of the spirit or gifts of grace gifts where we share grace. He's there talking about, okay, this is actually how we do this for the common good. It's how we serve others, which is why he then spends most of the chapter actually not talking about spiritual gifts, but actually on the body of Christ. Because that's the thing that we really need to grapple with. And so he says in verse 12, just as a body though one has many parts, but all its parts, many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. He's repeating Romans 12. Then in verse 14, even so the body is not made up of one part, but many. He's saying what we need to hear is that all parts are needed. All parts are needed. The body wonderfully has both diversity and unity, which is why it's so much better than individualism. See, individualism isolates us. We end up more and more alone because, oh, I disagree with that person and either I'm afraid of being cancelled or I'm just cancelling them or we end up kind of going, oh, that person, that, that, do I have enough capacity for them? That, that can be quite draining. What about me time? And all the way we're just stepping further and further away from people then ultimately it just comes down to the cost. What kind of cost do they put on me being me or you doing you? And so we end up standing alone. But here Paul's saying, no, the answer is that all parts are needed. Maybe you've had that soundtrack that plays in your head Saturday night before church. You're thinking, oh, do I want to go? Should I go? I've got all these things to do. They don't need me. Uh, they won't miss me. I'm not rostered. Hear what Paul says, verse 17. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? When we're not in it together, we're missing out. Just imagine this kind of conversation. I think this is what Paul's getting at, where Mr. Foot comes to Pastor Mouth and says to him, oh, I went to Eyes Growth Group, but look, I just didn't fit in. Just don't think it's for me. And at church, well, Mr. and Mrs. knows they just kind of keep their distance. And hand, oh, every time he gets up to pray, he just nails it. I just could never do that. Clearly, I'm not needed to pray. And Miss E, oh, she sings so beautifully. Forget it. Couldn't even be a part of that. Just got to let her go and do it. Paul's saying, no, we're all parts are needed. In fact, our identity can actually be only fully known and experienced in relationship, not only with Christ, but with his body. That's such an important thing for us to know because so much of our culture is about finding my identity. And individualism is going to take us over there, but that God is actually saying, no, to truly know who you are to know it and experience it only can be fully known with the body. That's why he says in verse 18, God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. What an incredible truth. We've got to let that sink in. God arranged the parts. He's not just talking about what God did with our physical body. He's saying you and I got put exactly where God wanted us to be. You see, this is a matter of trust, trusting that God does actually know best and that where he put you, that's the best place. He made us. And no, we don't get to choose. We can trust God that he's placed us in the best place. That's why Paul in Romans, Romans 12 on the inside of the cover there, verse 3, it says, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. He's really challenging us on, oh, I should be doing this, or I think I ought to be doing that. No. Look at ourselves with a sober judgment, he says. So all parts are needed but the other truth, he says, we need to hear that all parts are worthy. 
We had to actively seek to honor the weak, the suffering, the vulnerable in our communities. That's what it is to be a body. I mean, you think about it when you've sort of injured a part of your body, you, you take care of it, don't you? You don't just keep slamming the finger in the door. And so he says in verse 23, and the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with a special honor. That's what we are to do. Verse 24, but God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it. We are to follow God in this. We don't just value people who can make a contribution as we see it. That's not the life of the body. Verse 25, he brings it together. He says, we do this. We lift up the weak, the vulnerable, and the suffering so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. That is so important. Equal concern for each other. Because it's really simple. If everybody comes seeking to care for everyone else, then everybody's cared for, aren't they? Including me. So if I come going, okay, this is not ultimately for me, but I'm here to care for everybody else. And if everybody does that, then everybody's cared for. There's no division. Oh, you're more important, you're less. No. We value everyone. All parts are worthy. It's kind of like a fire. I'm pretty sure all of us have been around a fire at some point in time. If there's fires, logs on the fire, that kind of thing, and you take the log out of the fire, what happens? Yeah, fire goes out, the fire dies. That's us. We remove ourselves from the body. We're not going to have the life that we ought to have with Christ. But what happens if I pick that log up and I put it back in the fire? Comes back to life. That's right. That's like us. But one of the great things about it is this. Not only does it mean we get back on fire, but we're contributing. And that's exactly what it's like with the body. All parts are worthy and all parts are needed. Well, the great thing about this is what we're seeing with the body is that everyone is involved in bodybuilding. Everyone. See, the thing about Paul's use of the body is it's quite deliberate. It's not just about our oh, belonging. It's yes, it's about being there. It's also about building when I'm there. And so if we turn to Ephesians, uh, that passage on the back. You see, as we heard in the reading, Christ is pictured as this victorious king through his death and resurrection. And he's about to establish his kingdom and he could build it. He could grow it in any particular way he likes. He is that powerful. He is that victorious. And so it's really significant the way that he chooses to build his kingdom. So who are the builders? Well, it's us. We read about how he's given to the church ministers of God's word, those who share it, teach it. But what purpose? Is it so they'll do all the building? They'll do all the ministry? No. Verse 12, it's to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built. The body is to be our focus. Not just ourselves and our own faith and walk with Jesus, but the body. The body is to be our our agenda, not ours. Because what Paul's talking about here is that as we together we build, together we have a unity in Jesus. That's what he's talking about in verse 13. We do this building until we all reach unity. Unity in three things, in the faith and knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the full whole measure of the fullness of Christ, become like Jesus, we can't do that by ourselves, is what Paul's saying. That's why belonging to the body or to church isn't a spectator sport. And it's why we're to be passionate, passionate about one another becoming more like Jesus. Again, I don't just come for me. I come so that everybody else 
will be that more and more like Jesus. That's why we have our growth groups. Our growth groups, the stated aim is to grow together to be more like Jesus. If you're not in a growth group, I'd encourage you to be a part of that. And if you are, make sure each week you're coming, remembering, praying as you drive or walk there. I'm coming to grow together. So we grow together to be more like Jesus. And the thing is, you see, we, we have the building plans. We don't have to figure out what each church is supposed to be doing or what's it like. No, we have the building plans. It's to be more like Jesus. That's why Paul pitches the body and, and goes on to talk about maturity because a person shouldn't stay as a baby, should they? That's not a healthy thing. Uh, these are actually my baby shoes. They're cute. Aye, very blue and cute. It would be ridiculous for me to try and wear them now, wouldn't it? And even if I could get them remade the size that fits me, why? Why would I wear baby shoes? And we need to recognize, no, we can't be okay with just kind of staying immature, staying the same, maintaining. No, we are to be growing together to be more like Jesus. It's a love for Jesus that means we're loving each other. And so as Paul says there in Ephesians, we're going to be wanting to make sure others aren't getting smashed by the waves of life and blown away by false teaching. We're to be looking out and caring for one another and growing together. Instead, in verse 15, he says, speaking the truth in love. Now, when he talks about the truth here, he's not just saying, oh, the hard truth that I think everybody needs to know. He's talking in Ephesians about the truth of the gospel. Because that, as we keep telling one another the truth, the depth of the gospel, the good news of Jesus' death, resurrection, and lordship, he says, we will grow to become, in every respect, the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. That's what we need to be doing for one another, speaking the gospel, growing into this head. But it's not just us, verse 16, from him, from Christ, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love. It's Jesus who is at work with us, giving us the love that we need. You see how it's supposed to be done? Speaking the truth in love, building itself up in love as each part does its work. Not just certain types of people who like that kind of thing, but everyone in love. This is why it's not loving when Christians, and I, I know this has happened uh, kind of put other the rest of the church to the test. They don't tell anybody, but the test is, well, if I don't turn up for a couple of weeks, I'll test to see if anybody noticed I wasn't there. Surprise, we fail. That's why it's not loving to be in a community and, and have morning tea and and just either leave without talking to anybody or stand around and not talk to other people, wait for them to come and talk to me. Now, the loving building thing is to go and, and talk with people and actually listen, show a genuine interest in them, learning about them, and then seeking to build them up. You know, our conversations aren't meant to tear others down, but to build others up. So together we're like Christ. So when, when we're together, the loving thing to do is to really actually get into the, the deep things, not just the sport and the weather, and to pray for one another, to not run others down. That's a loving building. In the life of the body, we are all builders. And you know what? We all know the building plan is to be more like Jesus. Here at Mac. We're a church that is alive with Christ. That's just another way of talking about life as the body of Christ, isn't it? And so one of our key mission purposes is to serve Christ. And as I said before, this is the key push, if you like, of the body image. Yes, it's about belonging, and that means being there. But it's not just being there, it's building when we're there or serving Christ. 
Now, I've got to say, serving isn't about rosters. To serve Christ, we do it in so many different ways. It's about caring for other members, doing life together. That's what we mean by serving Christ as the body. Uh, in the book, Unmissable Church, I talked about it last week. They have two questions uh, about this that I think are really helpful. And one of the great thing is, these are things that we can all do. Two questions to ask ourselves. On our way to church, who can I pray for right now? Who at church, God, maybe you've got to pray for yourself just to get there. But um, hopefully... You'll be able to think of somebody, maybe you had a conversation last week, or maybe somebody you haven't seen for a while, or maybe that visitor. Pray. Who can I pray for? And as you walk through the doors, let that be this cue for your second question. Who can I sit with or talk with today? And ask God, who can I sit with and talk with? Lead me to that person. Two questions, two prayers, if you like. Imagine if we all asked ourselves those questions and prayed to God about them. What a massive difference that would make, wouldn't it? To us, as well as to being the body. As we're led in, maybe there's a visitor or maybe there's somebody sitting by themselves. See, here's the, the flip side of it is, if I don't, if you and I don't attend, we don't come. Or when we're here, we don't serve others. We're just looking to be served. Just think about what doesn't happen. There's no follow-up conversation to that person who's really struggling and, and hearing the prayer that they, they so need. Not from me anyway, if I don't, if I'm not there. Or maybe it's that visitor who missed another warm welcome from a Mac member. Or maybe it's that person who was sitting alone and ends up staying that way through the service. But instead, think about this. If each of us just spent five, maybe 10 minutes every week with a different person, just a different person each week, man, you'd get to know everybody in the church really well. But also just think about the, the sort of ripple effect of that impact, the prayers that are prayed, the supporting words, the, the loving speaking it would be huge. This is the life of the body as we seek to serve Christ, where every part is essential for building the body of Christ. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, what a privilege, privilege it is to belong to the body of Christ. May our church live as the body of Christ where all parts are needed and all are considered worthy. Empower us by this Holy Spirit to build the body in love as each part does its work. Amen. Well, make sure you're here next week as we look at the church as the temple.